What's going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the MLB Series Preview. I believe this is episode nine. Had some audio issues with the last one or one of them last week, but we did spaces instead, kind of skipped the whole rehashing of, of that whole recording. So we're here today, though, and uh, starting this week, I'm going to break it up a little bit differently. Don't know if I'm going to do this every single time there's slates divided like this, but uh, today I'm going to go over all of the series that are starting just today on Monday, and then we'll have a separate video probably dropping tomorrow uh, if everything goes well um, going over the series that start tomorrow as well. So make it a little shorter to the point, uh, and we'll have separate videos dropping. So uh, nothing really to recap because we been a week away, but I want to start it off talking about this Reds Pirate series, which seems to be the talk of the town today because we have Paul Skeens on the mound against, you know, a team in the Reds that strikes out a lot. And Paul Skeens is going to be pretty core pretty much any time he takes the mound, but especially now, it seems. I, I tweeted something that <laughs> I said, it's 9 a.m. I woke up on Twitter and I was like, yeah, it looks like Paul Skeens already pitched the perfect game before you went to sleep last night. There were millions of Skeens K's on the feed. Um, so needless to say, like, I don't disagree with the strikeouts necessarily. Am I going to take it myself? God, no, because I will never hop on Twitter PODs like that. But I think the whole, I don't know, Reds offense is getting undersold a little bit. The strikeout stuff, I absolutely get it. But uh, the Reds are, are kind of that team that when they do score, like they strike out a pretty good bit. You have a lot of guys in that lineup with a high K rate. Everybody knows Elliot De La Cruz strikes out plenty. Even at the bottom, you got the Will Bensons. You got really everybody in between who strikes out a good bit. Um, so the K upside is certainly there with Paul Skeens, but they're a boomer bust offense. So as much as those K's come, runs can also come. A solo shot can come. So I, I don't think the Pirates are nearly as free in this game period as, as everybody would seem to think. I think the Reds are certainly live here. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for that. Like the it, Skeens being extremely corp is definitely one of them, but we've seen him prone to give up a couple hard, a lot of hard contact when guys are sitting on that pitch. And the Reds, what they've actually done, and they've they've struck striking out plenty against a lot of pitchers, but when they faced high K rate pitchers recently, they've been more aggressive early in the count. Uh, so against Paul Skeens, especially where it's going to be a lot of you know that fastball sinker, I do think that's going to work for them to run into a little bit. So uh, I did take on Prize Picks Skeens over one half in runs for better or for worse. Uh, I do think we see runs in this game. It does seem like there's another weird entrapment as far as this game goes. Um, we have Paul Skeens on the bump. Super Corp, most popular pitcher maybe we've seen all season in this game, uh, going against the Reds offense that everybody thinks he's going to dominate. Then on the other side, we have the Pirates offense, which is coming out of cores, which has been a historical spot to fade and has definitely shown its head multiple times this season. I've talked about it on here. Uh, so now we see a total go from eight to eight and a half, which say what you want. You know, there's a little bullpen stuff involved. Maybe the books don't believe in Carson Spires, who's making, I believe, his first start of the season. He's come in for long relief, you know, at prior times. He started a little bit last year, but uh, really first time in the rotation this season for him. Uh, so maybe it's a little disrespect because of that, but it's still ML starting to come down towards the Reds, total creeping up. Seems like the writing's on the wall for this not to be as smooth sailing for Paul Skeens as a lot of people kind of think it's going to be today. So I would be very, very careful. Again, I don't disagree that the strikeout upside could be there, but I think the Reds' offense is going to be a little live to take this one as well, uh, especially when you get into the back end of the Pirates' bullpen. God forbid they make Skeens work a little bit. Um, that could be trouble towards the end of the game. So I do have a half you on the Reds as well. Um, not the biggest Paul Skeens fan today, I'll tell you that. He's going to look dominant in you know, some form for – innings here innings there but i do think there's the upside for the reds that they can just have that one inning that can set everything off for them so i do like them to make some noise today um and then we get into the rest of the series here we have nick lodolo against bailey falter which just to put in perspective the start today with paul Skeens has an eight and a half total and i'm looking at ba you know bailey falter against nick lodolo bailey falter has been really good uh weirdly outside of that one dodger start he's been relatively shut down lodolo since he's come back has been great you know, that total also has an eight and a half. So tell her what you think. But uh, I do like the Reds offense in that game as well. They've been hitting lefties, especially these softer tossing lefties, uh, a lot better. And part of that is because of the lefty killers they have in that lineup. Like, obviously, that doesn't include Ellie De La Cruz, even though he did hit a home run off a lefty yesterday. Um, they have guys like Stuart Fairchild and Platoons, you know, in that spot with like a Will Benson or whoever they decide on a given day, her to be is whoever. Um, 
he's been crushing lefties. Tyler Stevenson is crushing lefties, especially lefties of this kind. They have a lot of guys in that lineup that have hit really, really well against lefties. Now, in that same vein, the Pirates have also been really good against lefties as of late. Their numbers used to be near bottom of the league for a majority of the start of the season. They've ticked up enormously. And as of late, they've also been crushing lefties. So uh, I do lean runs in this first game with Skeens and Spires, and I think that can be majority reds if if everything goes their way, especially late in the game. Uh, Game two with Lodolo and Falter, I do see runs coming as well. maybe a little more evenly split. And again, we'll see what shape the bullpens are in, especially the Reds. If we're talking uh, Spires leash being a little uh, shorter than we kind of would expect. So I think this series as a whole is definitely going to see a flat game or so. And I kind of think it's the Hunter Green, Mitch Keller game. Uh, But I think there's going to be runs otherwise. And again, like the bullpen situations for both these teams, which the Pirates bullpen has been bad all season. It's only getting worse. The Reds bullpen has been bad all season, but it's getting better. It just kind of depends on the spot they're in. The whole situation after game one is certainly something to monitor for these teams because if it does linger into the entire series, that could scream runs all the way through. So uh, I definitely like the Reds in the series. Haven't checked series prices yet. Not all of them have been showing up for whatever reason, but I do like the Reds in the series. Stay hot. They've been playing good baseball lately. Just dropped one. I dropped a series to the Brewers. Easily could have won that series. Collapsed at the end of game three on Sunday. Uh, and then they split with the Guardians, you know, best team, one of the best teams in baseball, not named the Yankees right now. Uh, so I want to keep riding that wave. I want to keep riding that wave for sure. Uh, so we can move on from this series a little bit. Let's talk about the Padres, Phillies. And I guess I forgot to mention this in the Reds, Pirates, even though it isn't the game that's like significantly affected compared to some of the other ones on at least this slate, but it's looking like throughout the rest of the week, really good hitting conditions league wide. And, that includes heat in a lot of these places. We're seeing temperatures in the 90s in multiple parks, as well as wind blowing out, you know, 15 plus miles per hour, straight out, straight out to right, straight out to left, whatever. It's like that in a lot of these parks. Citizens Bank Stadium today, and it looks like tomorrow, happens to be in both of those situations. We're seeing hot temperatures, wind blowing out, which I think is disastrous, more so for Randy Vasquez than Christopher Sanchez but I think they're both in for a little moose in, in this game specifically. So I'm on the over. The squad rides the over. Randy Vasquez has been really bad against lefties. You know, he's been getting pieced up by a lot of teams, and lefties have done the majority of the damage. So when I look at the Phillies lineup, that's exactly a guy that I don't want. If I'm looking to back a pitcher, I don't want a guy that's going to be bad against Schwarber, Harper, you know, Stott. David Dahl has been, you know, hot towards the bottom of that lineup. So like Trey Turner is coming back today and that's all the buzz. And I think he's going to do fine in this matchup, but Randy Vasquez is I think in for quite a bit of trouble against this lineup. And it does help that, you know, those hitters get the ball up and then they can get the ball in the air quite a bit, which is huge on a day like this. So I think Randy Vasquez, especially if he doesn't give, you know, the end of that bullpen some length into this game, he gets into trouble early. I have real trouble leaning on the Padres pitching staff as a whole to, you know, hold that Phillies offense in check, which is why I like them. Um, on the other side, too, like I, I don't like the Padres against lefties. I've said that multiple times. They're starting to get better. I'm not fully convinced they've turned a corner, but some certain players have been turning a corner. Uh, some for the better, some for the worse. Like Tatis has been hot, but he hasn't really been crushing lefties at the, you know, his little streak here. But I trust them to start off the offense nevertheless. But there's a bunch of guys in there. The only hitter that I really target consistently against a lefty in the Padres lineup is Jerks and Propar. So uh, I know he's also a very popular option today. Kind of really fits his hitting profile, everything that he's going to see, the sinker slider from Christopher Sanchez. Uh, so I do think he's in a good spot. Hassan Kim is in a great spot. Like a lot of these guys are starting to hit a little better. I guess Jackson Merrill you can throw into the equation as well. Uh, starting to hit a little better against lefties. They also – one of their problems against lefties, they love to hit the ball into the ground. The thing is, like Christopher Sanchez, that's all he's going to throw. He wants you to hit the ball into the ground, uh, but he's giving up a lot more hard contact that it doesn't really work out that way for him to be successful. So I do see the Padres offense actually showing up in this one and being a, a confident force against a lefty for one of the few times that we've seen that. So I like the over here. Um, game two, we have Michael King, Aaron Nola. Such a, I guess both of these last two matchups are such a tough one to read, especially like when Michael King is super frustrating because he gives up a lot of hard contact, but he also has extreme strikeout upside when his stuff is on. And I'm not shocked or wouldn't be shocked if we do get that 
in game two, the strikeout upside. But especially if we see, you know, conditions that are the same today as they are tomorrow, I have trouble believing in Michael King, who's also shown his, you know, ability to have a home run problem at some times in this season. Uh, so that's probably going to show its face. Aaron Nola is such a streaky pitcher as well. Um, so again, this is another series that pay attention to the conditions, especially in that second game, because we do have guys that could have that home run problem surface, certainly towards the part of this end part of the series. Um, and then we talk about game three, like the one, one Philly that I'm probably not a hundred percent one Philly lefty that I'm not a hundred percent backing uh, the Padres to score runs against would probably be Ranger Suarez because he, he's a similar pitcher profile wise to Christopher Sanchez. He just obviously does everything better uh, and is not allowing nearly as much hard contact as Christopher Sanchez does. Plus, you know, the command of the strike zone is so much better that I do think he's going to be able to get to these righties and make a lot of soft contact happen for these bats. So I do think he's going to have a really solid start against the Padres. That's the, probably the one that I would back pitching in this instance. Uh, on the other side, you do have Matt Waldron, who's been really, really good recently. Again, if conditions stay the same, maybe that comes back to bite him a little bit. But I do really like Ranger Suarez in in that uh, that game three for sure. I can show you just for a little bit of comparison here because Ranger Suarez, he, he's been fantastic. It's not really – a secret keeps the ball on the ground very, very well. I mean, look at the savant page 170 ERA, one or just about 1 8, 10 and 1 on the season. So, everything that he does has just been absolutely fantastic. And he's gone through like a little bit of a blip, I guess, recently. And it's not all his fault. Um, because like he left that start against the Phillies with getting hit by a line drive, he came back, probably should have given up more runs against the Mets. But then he followed that up with. Frankly, another star where you probably should have get on more runs against the Orioles. So you could say regression looming, but I don't know if that's going to come to bite him against the Padres offense that is just not hitting against lefties. And like I talked about, I want a guy who's not giving up hard contact to be the guy that I continue to back lefties against against them. Um, and Ranger Suarez definitely seems to be that guy, but it is still worth mentioning that current corner that I'm talking about the Padres turning. They're starting to get there, and this is a, a pretty relatively large sample size compared to the rest of these teams. They've had 480 plate appearances, 470 plate appearances against lefties, and this is since May 17th, so just about the uh, the last 30 days we're talking about here. They're getting much, much better. The strikeout rate is still very low, which that's been a thing since the start of the season. So if they do start to really heat up just as a collective unit, I wouldn't be surprised. I think we see – you know, parts of that against Christopher Sanchez today, maybe not as much of it against Ranger Suarez on uh what is that gonna be? Wednesday? Wednesday. Um so yeah, that's that's kind of my thoughts here. I can go back to Ranger Suarez again, like 80 percentile hard hit rate. That's something that I'm I'm kind of looking for. Cause that, that seems to be the one area that they kind of get him to. And then we talk about Christopher Sanchez, just about half that. So that's that's kind of my deal with why. I think he's going to be a little more susceptible. He's also very due for regression himself, as good as it seems like he's been with a, just about a three ERA XBA. He's gotten very fortunate on a lot of hits, and a lot of those are really hard hit ground balls, which, again, the one area where the Padres have been successful lately. So, uh, very sold on this over game one squad ride. Hope it you know soars over. That would be great. Definitely sold our Ranger scores in game three. If conditions hold, King Nola could also be a turkey fest in game two, but that's something we'll check on. Be sure to tune into BTL. We'll be talking about that plenty. Let's go to Miami. So I think this series is, is pretty fascinating. And like I talked about, the Cardinals are starting to play well, 100%, but the guy who is not really, I don't know, turning up as they're turning up is Sonny Gray. And I don't want to say he started to hit a wall, but he hasn't been nearly as effective. Like he still has a three ERA, three Oh one, just about, uh, but as of late, he hasn't looked the same. And like, he's coming off the start that he so badly needed um, against the pirates where he went seven innings, one run, nine Ks. Uh, but before that, you know, he was tripping up at home against the Rockies. Didn't even get through five. He gave up four against the Phillies. One of the hottest offenses in baseball. Sure. I'll give him a pass at that point. Um, but it's just been spotty. It's not that dominant ace that we've been seeing time and time again that you just look and you see, oh, Sonny Gray's on the bump. Uh, the Cardinals are at least going to be in this game because it's going to be low scoring. 
kind of tough because it hasn't been the same guy. If you've watched him, like he's kind of up the strikeout stuff in certain matchups, but the hard contact is getting there a little more and more. And when we talk about him going to Miami, like, yes, that's the Marlins, not the best run scoring environment in Miami. It's, you know, you're not going to see weather involved either there. Uh, but look what he's done on the road really quickly past this Oakland start. Uh, and I'll show you the exact like ERA difference in a bit. Four runs against the Mets, six runs against the Brewers, five runs against the Angels, and then the the four runs against the Phillies, which I don't know how the schedule has fell. So he only has, you know, four or five uh, road starts to this point, but it hasn't been pretty for Sonny Gray on the road. And you see right here, it's a drastic difference. 5-1-4 on the road, 1-5-5 at home. It's crazy. I mean, he's given up seven earned runs and seven home starts. He's an ace at home, but 16 runs and five home runs, especially, is wild. Uh, and, you know, these five games on the road, especially when you consider, I mean, some of those starts were against offenses that were middling at that point. So the Marlins, I do think, have the tools to get to Sunday Gray. Now, what does that mean for the Marlins? It probably doesn't mean six runs. It could mean three, maybe four if they really get to him. But, you know, guys like Brian De La Cruz, you know, guys like, I don't know, Jazz Chisholm, if he's really feeling it that night. Um, they have the tools to get to him. They're kind of like the Reds in the sense, like, they can be a boomer bust offense, but uh, the strikeouts upside is probably going to be there, even though the Marlins have not struck out much against right-handed pitching as of late. Um, but I think the Marlins offense is is alive in this one to score a few and potentially get the win. Do I love back in the Marlins bullpen, even though it has been a little better? Not as not the biggest jump like the A's have made. Um but yeah, it's been it's been decent. It's been enough. I, I do lean the Marlins in this game. I wouldn't be shocked if we get runs here. Um, if we're talking about just pure splits as well, I mean, the Cardinals sitting down here, you know, 22nd, just an 89 WRC plus against lefties the last 30 days, uh, 4.1% walk rate, which is also for a guy like Braxton Garrett. Um, you've seen like his worst starts. I guess I can pull those up here. Like he hasn't had great command of the strike zone. Now that all, all doesn't always equate to walks for him specifically. Um, Cause he's been fantastic at limiting those. Um, but you can see like the couple starts where he does kind of lose it, especially like the first one of the season against the Phillies. That's when he had two walks, he gave up five runs, uh, all these starts where he's not even sniffing a walk is you know, the, his best starts of the season. So, like, if you've watched some of these starts, like the Rays one specifically, there's a walk, you know, there's five runs, no command of the strike zone. Uh, the Rays were super patient, got into deep counts. If you have a team that's not going to get into deep counts, which the Cardinals have really not shown the ability to, especially against lefties lately, Braxton Garrett could have a pretty solid day. So I'm leaning into him a little bit, but also uh, leaning into Sonny Gray being not great on the road either in this matchup. So sprinkle on the Marlins. Um it's kind of my thoughts there. Game two, though, especially if the Mall is doing game one, Rotary Munoz, who I did fade with the Mets in his last start out. He had like a no-hit bid going into the seventh inning or something near that. Uh, I would like to fade him against this Cardinals lineup as a little little bounce back. Love fading guys off of starts like that, but uh, especially because like Lance Lynn on the other side, I think the Marlins – there's a different way to put this because Lance Lynn's just kind of – he's going to challenge you. He's a vet. He pitches with his ego a little bit too much. But, like, for teams like the Marlins, I think that works because you're essentially just daring them to hit edge-of-the-zone fastballs, which that's not – outside of, like, Brian De La Cruz and then, again, maybe the straight jazz Chisholm. A lot of this lineup hasn't been able to handle all that well from the right side. Now, like, are they worse against lefties, you know, just in general? Yes, but – Pitchers like this from the right side have also given them a little bit of trouble. So I uh, do think Lance Lynn can have a decent start. I really do want to fade Munoz after his uh, no-hit bid, of course. Uh, and then Kyle Gibson can kind of do the same thing. These veteran pitchers, I guess, as a whole, have just given the Marlins a little bit of trouble. We don't know he's pitching against Gibson. So kind of null and void there yet. But I do think the Marlins are, are very live to sneak game one against Sonny Gray and then don't know how much life they have after that in this series. Kind of my main thoughts there. We can move. Talk about Boston and Toronto. Start with game one, pathetic Kikuchi. Another, it seems like, popular pick today, which, I mean, it's probably never good when the Blue Jays are a popular pick, but it's because of the, you know, a couple of things. It's because of the Sunday Night Baseball narrative team that's 
coming off of Sunday Night Baseball with travel, even though in this case it's not a very far traveling situation. It's not like it's probably the best that we've seen uh, out of the teams that kind of fit this system. Um, so there's that, plus the fact that the Red Sox have just been absolutely pitiful against left-handed pitching the entirety of the season. Now, uh, I do have to say this, like we're bringing up these splits here. This is the last 30. The Red Sox are middle of the league, and the strikeout rate is still somewhat high, which I get, but just overall, their numbers against lefties, I was auto fading them You know, last month, of course, when their lineup wasn't healthy, but now they get guys back, which drastically changes the look of this lineup because – it's a lot better against left-handed pitching, as you can see by the numbers. And I could even, I won't, you know, dumb it down to the last couple of weeks, but I'll, I'll tell you they've been better. You don't have to go through all that, but they've been better. And Tyler O'Neill, you know, is a big add to that. There's a lot of big ads in that lineup that have been doing their job. Uh, the strikeout rate is still a little high. So, like, everybody's on Kikuchi K's today, which is understandable. But uh, if there's one team that I think can break the Sunday night baseball, curse or system or whatever it may be you know playing a team that's traveling it's probably the blue jays in this this game tonight i do lean red Sox here uh kikuchi i think is in for a little bit of trouble tonight he's had trouble against the Sox historically but this lineup you know fully healthy i think profiles a lot better against lefties than they did you know back in mid-april or early may or something like that so uh, this is a low total game, you know, sitting at seven and a half. Don't think there's going to be a, a lot of offense in this game, but I do think there could be a stray, you know, Tyler O'Neill Homer or somebody like that uh, that really sets it off for Kikuchi. Uh, so I do think he gives up a couple. Pavetta on the other side, like the Blue Jays lineup as a whole, you could argue like should be able to get to Pavetta for a couple different reasons. Pavetta has reverse splits. So, uh, or at least as of late has reverse splits. So, the Jays lineup has a ton of righties in it, which has usually been to their demise against a lot of righties. It shouldn't be here, but Pavetta, a big kind of reason for his struggles has been a lack of command of the strike zone. And when you look at what the Jays are doing as of late against righties, like they're walking a good bit, but it's a little deceptive because when they face guys like Pavetta, who they've seen him, you know, a couple couple times which a lot of the guys in the lineup have they've been super aggressive early in counts so i think that's going to continue to drop uh crabs brought up the super weird square of pavetta walks which is super green and juice the under if he has command of the strike zone if the curveball is falling for strikes he's going to get this blue jays team into a lot of soft contact which that's not a hot take because that's been what they've been doing for the past two months uh especially against righties but yeah this this Kind of screams like it's going to be a pretty decent game for Bet for Beta for me, and only a Kikuchi bang or two might make the difference. So, do kind of lean the Red Sox here. Probably not going to get to the counter because I really don't love betting against the Sunday Night Baseball system, but I, I do think it's going to be a vastly different look than I guess a lot of people are expecting in that you know that game tonight. Uh, beyond that, I really don't have too many thoughts um, the rest of the series outside of Brian Bayo pitching Game Three. Uh, We've talked about it like a bunch, really bad against lefties. I can bring up a splits. Um, that's been the story really since he came into the league. He couldn't pitch to lefties. And I, I kind of thought, and a lot of us thought he was turning a corner earlier in the season, but it turned out to just be a result of the matchups that he was facing because um, the, the issues are right there where they are. They haven't gotten any better. Uh, but the thing with the Blue Jays is a lot of righties. Yes, they have, you know, Horwitz in there now. So it's an additional lefty. They have Varsho in there who can be okay. Maybe they pull out like Kiermaier in the back end. All lefties that like nobody really scares you right now, except for, you know, Varsho, who also swings through a lot of pitches. He has pretty high whiff rate. So I think Brian Bayo can have a pretty solid start. Now, same issues that we talked about, not in the season preview or series preview, but on BTO, we were targeting the Guardians last Friday. And the Guardians are, are a little different from the Red Sox in the sense that the low strikeout rate is not necessarily there, but they do still have the lefties that I think could cause damage against Kevin Gosman, who's also been much worse at home. So Red Sox, I think, are also live in game three of that series, which, again, that's probably going to be at a plus chicken price because Bayo versus Gosman. But the Chase are just always you know, pretty overvalued when they're playing in Toronto. So uh, I do think sneaky Red Sox spot, especially if they can sneak game one of this series, uh, you know, coming with travel over the border and Sunday night, big ask, but 
Uh, I do definitely lean them to win this series. It is tough to play in Toronto, no matter how much the Jays can't hit. Uh, but maybe a, maybe a little momentum carrying from big series win against the Yankees. Could be the difference there for the Red Sox. Can move to the next series, Tigers-Braves. Speaking of momentum, uh, it seems to seems to like the naked eye that the Braves are starting to pick it up. I'm not 100% there yet because – uh, they did face like a couple pitchers for the Rays, like in, in Zach Littell and Ryan Pepio, who they let the ball in the air quite a bit, especially as of recent. So that kind of played right into the Braves, like what they needed to see in the series because they've been pounding the ball into the ground for so long for the entirety of the season. That's been their problem. So when pitchers have been able to pitch to that, they've been really successful. Now, the reason why I'm not sold on them just yet in the series, and I kind of got to see it, Reese Olsen, what has he been fantastic at? He's been fantastic at keeping the ball on the ground and pitching off of that again, which is why, I mean, we see an eight total in this game. Max Fried, obviously a huge part of that as well. But Reese Olsen, this is his specialty. When he is on, he is keeping the ball on the ground. Same goes for Casey Mize. Not as good at, uh, at it as you know Reese Olsen has been because he's not putting up the numbers he has either. But when he's good, he's keeping the ball on the ground. So – uh, the first two guys, like, yeah, one of them, they could probably have the tools to hit up a little bit between Olsen and Mize, probably going to be Mize, but I, I wouldn't sleep on the Tigers in this series. And like, I love Max Freed. I love, you know, Ronaldo Lopez. So potential for two really good pitching matchups there in game one and game three, but I really got to see it with this Braves team. I got to see it consistently for more than one series. I do love the at-bats, not as a race fan who's watching the game, but I, I love the at-bats that I saw from Austin Riley, you know, Travis Darno, Matt Olson, they look comfortable at the plate. They look like they were taking more confident swings. I'm going to err on the side now that I do think it was very matchup based. And while I do think they're picking up momentum a little bit, it's really hard not to when they've been hitting as bad as they are. I'm a little weary. I'm a little weary of saying this is a Braves are back situation. So um, I, I do kind of like Reese Olson in that start. I would not be surprised if the Tigers snuck game one as well, as much as I do really, really like Freed. Uh, and backing him in certain matchups, the Tigers have not been great against lefties. So I'd be lying if I said I, I kind of thought they were going to drill him. But Reese Olsen can hold his own in this matchup, I think. So I, I do kind of lean them in game one. Uh, my Schwellenbach probably in over, even though, like I talked about, Mize keeping the ball on the ground. I have a pretty good feeling he's going to give up a little more hard contact than he would like to, which that could lead to Braves runs. Uh, and then Schwellenbach is a good pitcher for the Tigers to face because – you can throw a lot of fastballs, and I think the lefties especially can take advantage. Cough, cough, Riley Green. Um, then we get to Tariq Scooball, Ronaldo Lopez. That's going to be a fantastic pitching matchup. We haven't really seen it still for the Braves against lefties. Like their their numbers are very, very deceptive. We've talked about them all season because if you've watched them against lefties, nothing has really been great. And like as of late, you can look at their numbers in the last thirty days. Now we're starting to see what the Braves kind of really are. Sorted by WRC plus, they're just a below average team against lefties. 90 WRC plus, not walking, striking out a good bit. So, Tariq Scooball could have the world in his hands in that start. And I, I do have a pretty good feeling that game's going to be for the series. So, if you're looking for uh, maybe the plus chicken that nobody's really expecting, it might be on the Tigers in this series. Can move on from that series, go to the next set of four. Reminder just doing the ones that are starting up today. Um, Giants, Cubs, talk about weather. This is the main, I would say, weather game that's involved. Wind blowing out in Wrigley. So it's the obvious reason why we see a 10 and a half total uh, as far as this first game goes between Jordan Hicks and Assad. I do still think that's a little odd given the way these two offenses have been recently. Like the Giants have been better, sure. Uh, did just drop the series against the Angels, though, but did put up 13 runs in the last game. So maybe you can say the offense is starting to see the ball better. Uh, but they also do put the ball in the air quite a bit, which it's not something Assad has been extremely prone to necessarily. Um, he is a, a contact pitcher more so like the strikeout stuff is not necessarily there, but he kind of falls right in the middle, like average ground ball rate, just below average, you know, hard hit rate. Again, strikeout stuff is not great Whiff and chase, not great. So I'm going to err on the side of saying the Giants are going to put the ball in the air and they're going to put the ball in the air pretty often, which 
if you're putting that in the air against in Wrigley Field with the wind blowing out as hard as it is and the weather conditions as a whole, it's probably going to lead to runs. So I, I do like their matchup. The Giants have been like pretty pesky against right-handed pitching too for I would say the last month or so as well. Um, just about like league average, I would say. I can bring up the splits. Yeah, they're right here. Just about league average. They've had some matchups where they really give a pitcher trouble. You know, the walk rate's been getting higher and higher. They're up here, just about league average as well. That made a massive jump. Uh, so I do think Assad is going to have a little bit of trouble there. Jordan Hicks, kind of same deal. He's not a matchup that I really care for. Can you trust the Cubs bats? I don't really know. But in the conditions, I certainly can get myself around to it. And talk about the back of these bullpens, nothing that really scares me at all. So uh, I, I'm usually not in love with these you know, high overs in Wrigley and when you're really expecting it, like you were, a lot of people were expecting it to see it last weekend in that series and those couple games soared under. Uh, this series, I wouldn't be surprised if you see a lot more of it, especially late in these games. Uh, the one that I probably will not be backing it is, is Logan Webb, Justin Steele. Unless we come around it tomorrow and everybody and their mother is on this under, which I could see it. Um, but those guys, those two guys are really good at keeping the ball on the ground. So the Wrigley wind, if that is still a factor tomorrow, probably won't have the biggest odds or the biggest effect on them as far as pitching Arsenal goes. So like that, we're probably going to see some form of bullpen game in game three. It looks like right now it says Hendricks. That's probably going to change to an opener than Hendricks. Giants, probably a bullpen game, maybe a Keaton win game, whatever it may be. Uh, probably runs. Probably runs there as well. So runs in that series. Probably runs in, in this series as well. Uh, Dodgers versus the Rockies. And it's a tough series because uh, coming into it, the Dodgers just lost Yoshi. They just lost Mookie. Uh, so everybody's pretty down on the Dodgers right now. And uh, I don't want to push the button too many times fading them. Uh, but in game one, I kind of do. I am on the Rockies plus one and a half. Another like semi-popular pick, probably the most popular of the dogs today. Uh, and I get why. Because Cal Quantrill's on the mound, which you can certainly argue. I don't think anybody's giving you any shit for it. He's been their most reliable option arms-wise. Uh, and he's kind of tweaked his arsenal at the start of the season. So it plays a little more in cores. So, like he's been good. He hasn't been fantastic. He's kind of tailed off from you know a Cy Young start at the season, but he's still putting up good numbers. So He's still sitting, you know, with a 3-3 ERA, which is great in cores. Uh, due for a little regression, maybe, but that's the story of Cal Quantrill. Um, like, he pitched well. Like, two straight shutouts he's coming off of against the Cardinals and Twins. Fantastic outings. He did get hit up a little bit by the Dodgers just a couple weeks ago, but it's a little different of a situation. I do think you don't have to rely on Cal Quantrill in the start, to be honest with you, because I've talked about it plenty. This Me taking the Rockies today is not really – a backing of Cal Quantrill as much as it is a fate of James Paxton because this guy, I mean, probably the worst sub four ERA pitcher I've ever seen. I mean, look at this. He's not striking anybody out. He is walking the bases full. He's due for a lot of regression in every single area, not keeping the ball on the ground anymore, not keeping the ball, you know, keeping soft contact off the board. So it's just a, a tough ask to get him to come to this Rockies team, which he hasn't faced, which is – I really wish I would have seen a little bit of sample size there. But uh, I feel like this Rockies team matches up similarly to the Pirates, which are they going to do this in the start? No, not necessarily. Uh, maybe you don't see seven seven runs, six earned. But the Rockies team has been destroying lefties as of late. Part of that is because they've been playing them in core, sure. But when you talk about Ezekiel Tovar, when you talk about weirdly – Jacob Stallings, when you talk about Brent Doyle, who may or may not play today, depending on what his status is. But there's a lot of guys up and down that lineup that have been seeing lefties really, really well. Now, Nolan Jones has been reinserted into this lineup, which I mean, that really doesn't help you any lefty-lefty, but it's a lefty with not great strikeout stuff, which is exactly what Nolan Jones wants to see. So uh, not only have they been really good against lefties, just in general, I'll bring up these splits here for you too, um, Almost a 10% walk rate, which is high. Six percentile. Great for you know people facing James Paxton. Uh K rates low ish, you know, bottom half of the league. WRC plus wise, they are right up here at eighth in the league. So like everything's kind of clicking right now for them against lefties. This is also the spot where the Rockies are in the middle of a homestand. They just played the Pirates. 
uh, and the team is coming into court. So one of the most profitable spots to bet the Rockies. I've said it a million times. It's when they're, they've already been in cores, they're starting a series, and the team's coming there. So uh, I do have a lot of hope for their offense in this matchup. I usually don't rack back the Rockies' full game, but Cal Quantrill, for the most part, has been the guy that can eat innings for them. So I am hoping, especially with you know Shohei at the top of this lineup, he's been pretty aggressive, I would say, and a lot of the Dodgers lineup has been. So uh, I do think that Cal can be pretty efficient against the Dodgers lineup, even if he's given up a couple runs, which is probably bound to happen. So uh, give me the Rockies in this game, plus one and a half. I think they win. We probably see runs in this game as well. Uh, but other than that, I don't know how much offense I, or how much Rockies exposure I want for the rest of the series. Part of that is just because, you know, it's tough to push the button when they just lose, you know, MVP candidate Mookie Betts, of course. Uh, so a lot of people are going to be fading them, especially if they end up losing this first game. But Walker Bueller against Gomber. Gomber has been awful. I don't want to jump in front of that train. Ryan Felton has also been terrible. Don't want to jump in front of that train. Uh, Bobby Miller, first start back, I believe, though, in cores. Tricky waters, but, you know, so other than that, Ty Block's been been pretty good, so that would probably be my only inkling to get back in on the Rockies. Uh, but it's it's a tough sell. It's a tough sell other than that. So don't love any of the matchups past that. I'll probably leave it at that, and we can move. Um, these two last series, I don't have too much on. The Mets, Rangers, these are two offenses that you just can't trust right now. The Rangers have been bad. They just got swept. Offense dominated in series in Seattle. Teams that have come back from that have kind of had like the Corsus effect. If you look at how they've done the season, they have a, a game where they have a hangover and really don't score any runs. And maybe that's just coincidence, but it seems to be the way things go. And now they're facing David Peterson, who is not very good, but he uh, – or not, not any bot, but the Rangers have just been god awful against lefties. It's there's no real selling point for me here, especially if this lineup is without Seeger for a game or two. He's been in and out of the lineup. Who really knows what the story is going to be with him long term? But I'm just kind of good on the series. John Gray's been great, so maybe an under game one. This series gives me like Blue Jays Guardians vibes. I would say where we're probably going to see close games, low scoring games for the majority of it, no matter like how what pitchers step on the mound because it's just going to be that type of series. So uh, I don't like many unders really in this set of series. That's probably ones that I would go to there. Um, so wish I had more to talk to you about there, but the Mets and Rangers is just a series. I want very little betting exposure in. And if that changes, I'll be on BTL to tell you about it. But uh, similar deal here with Brewers Angels, I guess this honestly probably would have been a better comparison for that Guardians Blue Jay series. Uh, low scoring here. I don't really know what to expect from Rodriguez. We've seen him for one start. I saw flashes of stuff that I would like against the Angels, but the Angels are just a very random team. They come out with the toughest matchups against righties, and you know they had two home runs in, in the first two innings, and they come out with Musha, you know, matchups against righties, and they can't see a baseball. So, I mean, it's not a secret that they've been much better against left-handed pitching by a wide margin for really this entire season. They're not going to get to see, you know, a lefty unless it's out of the pen for the Brewers. So I do think this sets up pretty well for the Brewers pitching staff in general, especially if Rodriguez can be somewhat efficient and start one. Uh, and Tobias Myers, we've seen flashes of his stuff as well. It would just be so angels for them to finally show up in the series against like Freddie Peralta in game three. Um, but, you know, Freddie Peralta did just get blown up at the hands of the Reds when everybody was also backing him because the Reds' offense is bad. You know, they strike out a lot, yada, yada, yada. That didn't work. Um, but it's kind of the vibes uh, I'm kind of getting from this series. I, I don't love runs in this series, but I could see the Angels' bats waking up towards the end of it, and that comes with the Brewers' team that's not hitting lefties especially well either with Tyler Anderson on the other side who also just seems to keep pitching above its head. So, That'll probably do it for me. Reminder, we'll be back most likely tomorrow. If anything changes, I will let you guys know. But most likely tomorrow with the second batch of series that are going to be starting up on Tuesday, going into Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, so make sure to leave any comments on games that you would like to hear from that batch of series, what you like from these batches of series as well. Uh, if you like me kind of splitting it up like this, so I'm not just dumping a bunch on you at once. Uh, yeah, just give me all feedback. Good luck on your bets this week. We'll be back on BTL tomorrow and back here most likely talking about the other series. So best of luck and we will be seeing.